Um, next up, I have Celeste, um, who has a really exciting title um, for Women Who Dare. So Celeste, over to you. Thank you, Juan. Good morning, colleagues, and good afternoon for colleagues who are a little farther away. It's great to see so many familiar faces. And it's actually really great to do this presentation right after Ingrid and Moon Moon, and a big hello to you guys. I really miss you. And so I'm going to do the presentation actually also about the women's participation. Um, I don't know if I can share my screen one or you will share from your side. And you can go ahead. I'm trying. Um, okay, one second. Um, can you share from your side because it's asking me to change system preferences that will take a while. I didn't realize of that. Of course, I have Bruce. Are you picking this up or am I? Okay, Excellent. Bruce will be our so this is a piece of independent research that I conducted when I was uh, working in Bangladesh, uh, and it was done with the support from colleagues from, from IOM. Um, so yeah, let's jump straight into it. Um, I will try to do uh, the presentation as brief as possible, and if we don't get to touch on all the topics, that's perfectly fine. You can find the presentation and the, and the research later. So if we can go to the next slide. So uh, here I was in Bangladesh, uh, late 2018, uh, roughly a year after the displacement, big emergency. Um, all the camps had a quite a different approach to governance, had different groups, different ways to engage women. Um, some, some camps didn't even have women representation at all. There was a lot of opposition from the camps in charge. And we were starting to talk about potential elections in the camp, which I thought it was fascinating. Um, but in these conversations, we were talking to um, among colleagues about like if there should be a quota for women in this um, governance system. And there was a lot of disagreement. Sometimes it was voiced publicly and sometimes not, but there was a lot of concerns. Um, because uh, as, as the colleagues mentioned in the Rohingya community, there are gender norms that prevent women from going out of their home most of the time. There was a research at the time that was showing that around 40% of Rohingya women spend between 21 and 24 hours at home, which is pretty much the entire day, right? Um, and there was also research showing that these um, gender norms were so rooted in the, in the community that uh, the Rohingyas understood it as part of their dignity, their sense of dignity. And also they associated these gender norms with their practice of Islam, with their religion. So of course it was extremely sensitive for us to, to engage in like trying to in any way um, change these uh, gender norms in the community. Uh, there were questions about what was our role uh, regarding these gender norms, if we should uh, intervene or not. And if we of course had a quota for women to participate, either way we would be intervening. Um, and I started thinking about all these topics and I started uh, reading about this and um, you know how uh, all the commitments that we have done to gender equality as a humanitarian community and to participation um, have been sort of um, changed in the way that we, we apply them because of the, the, the call for neutrality within humanitarian action. And of course, we always want to respect the cultural practices of the community, but at the same time, we do have these commitments to, to gender equality and to participation. So like, how do we operationalize this? It's, it's very easy in paper, but when we're in the field and we actually have to make these tough calls, it's actually very difficult to make a decision that is respectful of the community, but at the same time is respectful of the individual rights of both men and women. So here I was, uh, if we move to the next slide, at the time, um, women who were participating um, both in like uh, paid uh, positions with NGOs or just in like uh, participatory structures like the governance structures from CCCM, uh, they were facing a lot of threats. Um, some of them were having harassed when they were going to the meetings. Uh, some others, um, there were uh, people from armed groups showing up at their homes at night, threatening uh, their male relatives, sometimes beating them up. So it was a very serious situation. However, um, women were still showing up. So for me, this, this was, this was um, I don't know, it was quite shocking because uh, we knew that uh, the gender norms were part of the understanding of dignity of the com uh, Rohingya community. Um, and we knew that this was part of their religious practice. And we knew that they were at very high risk sometimes when they were participating. But here, women, women were still showing up. Uh, so I asked myself, uh, why is this? Why are women still showing up? Um, are they uh, experiencing this participation as, as something that is being forced upon them that they do because they have no other choice? Um, 
you know, I, I, I took these questions very seriously and that's where my research started. So if we can move to the next slide, I asked myself three questions. Uh, basically, I wanted to know about the motivation of the women that participated. I also wanted to know how they were navigating the gender norms that exist in the community because they were managing to participate. But we know this is sort of, you know, against the traditional norms. So, so I, I was wondering, like, how do they manage to do this? And the third question is like, I wanted to know what sense they were making of this change because we knew um, how, you know, we had some information at that point of like how, how the Rohingya community was culturally wise, like, you know, there were, there were already some research coming out. Um, but we also could see that things were changing. We also could see differences between the younger generation and the older generation. And we could see that there were, you know, women that were able to and willing to participate. So I, I was asking myself, how do they make sense of, of all of this that is happening, all of this that is changing? Um, do they feel that this is contrary to their values or not? I, I was really uh, intrigued by this. So I'm going to tackle these three questions as much as I can in like less than 10 minutes. Uh, if we can go ahead. The first question was motivation. And I, I asked them when, when I did this interview with women, it was around 20 women from two different camps. Um, and something that struck me is that most of them said that the, their initial motivation was that they were expecting material support from the groups. And I thought this was extremely problematic because of course there was no material support coming from, from these uh, governance groups. Um, and they knew so, and I asked them like, did people promise this to you? And they said, no, like nobody promised me any material support, but you know, I assumed that if I showed up, I would have some sort of benefits. And in some cases that was true, like uh, the female magis of one of the camps, for example, um, the, the magis, the, the male leaders were giving them uh, some vouchers sometimes. So like they were receiving some extra support. So in some cases it was truth, but in the majority it wasn't. So then I asked them like, okay, so you were expecting material support that didn't happen. You, you, all these women had been participating for over a year. So what made you remain in the groups? Uh, and then that's where, when other things came up, like access to information was super important to them. The opportunity to learn, like they, they, they really highlighted that they had no access to education before. These are adult women coming from Myanmar. Of course, they had no access to education. And now at least they have, you know, information about like hygiene practices and whatnot. And they, they were able to show that to their children. And now they, you know, they saw themselves as, as women who, who had good information, who had resources in a way. Um, then the opportunity to socialize, they were um, separated from their communities of origin because uh, as some research already proves, like they, they were not within the, the larger community that they were when they were in Myanmar. So this opportunity to, to meet other women, especially after such a traumatizing event was very important for them. Um, they also mentioned the opportunity to meet with like more experienced older women, the APAs, um, and that also gave, gave them a lot of value. And the last thing was um, many of them like simply like they were real leaders. They, 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 sh they felt that they had something to bring to the community and they wanted to, you know, help others serve the community. In many instances, they mentioned that there were um, issues that concerned women or mostly women. And, and that's why women representation was needed, which I thought was amazing. Um, the room was a bit more divided when I asked them like if they were also, um, if women also should be engaged in decisions that didn't involve mostly women or mainly women. Some of them said that the male mages can make the call. Some others were like, no, actually women should be involved in all decisions, which was great uh, for me. <laughs> uh, next slide. The second question that I asked them was like, okay, like, you know, um, how did you manage to, to, to come here? Like, you know, I understand that, you know, women are expected to stay at home. What happened there? And, and most of them recounted the same story, except the, the widows and the, the ones that didn't have a husband, which were a minority. The ones that were adult uh, married women uh, shared a very similar um, story that was that they, they, they talked to their husbands and their husband said no and they said let me go once and if it's good then I can continue going and basically they had this one chance to go and when they came back they said actually the meeting is good and the husbands allowed them but there was always an exchange and the decision was always made by the, by the husband which shows that the, the, they are not challenging the norms at the end of the day they are not breaking the rules they are still going through the system but they are sort of pushing the system and this is of course like not all the women it's a minority of women that I interviewed and the ones that managed to participate and there are also women that 
that have very young children and sometimes don't manage to go to the meetings. But you know, it does show that, that they are actually agents of change. They are the ones negotiating for their own interests. And sometimes we forget about this when we talk about women as vulnerable and as victims. And we highlight that a bit too much to my understanding. Um, housework was always an issue that they had to discuss because of course it's the women's task in the, in the community. Um, only one of them managed to have her husband support her with, with housework. For the other cases, it was mostly women like taking over more responsibilities, so housework and the public sphere. Uh, so like the double burden that we usually talk about. And some others were delegating the work to younger women, often uh, young girls, which is an unintended consequence of participation. But at the end of the day, the, the work has to be done. And if the, if the husband is not stepping in because gender norms are changing, but changes too slowly, then you know there are some consequences there that we usually don't see until we, we start discussing them. Um, in terms of the community, uh, I really had to dig with this because like most of them said that actually the community was supportive, but we knew that there were threats, that there was harassment. Um, when I digged a little more, uh, they said that yes, some of them, you know, when, when going to the meetings, they were being uh, asked by the neighbors or sometimes the imams were making, uh, making public speeches about this, but they said, mm -hmm. as long as my husband allows me and as long as I'm well behaved when I'm outside the house, I'm still complying with the, the norms, the, what, what is expected of me, and I'm okay. The issue was mostly when the neighbors would go directly to the husband uh, and the husband would be put in a difficult position because of course the husband is supposed to uh, guard the women, the adult you women in his household. outside, it's okay, huh? Ah, sorry. You and I have three minutes, have I think. Sit so. outside. Oh. One, you're sorry, I apologize. <laughs> That's okay, we can go to the, to the next slide. I will leave the link to the research. This is just a, a, a pick for you to, to get engaged and hopefully want to read it. So the last point that I discussed with the women was like, how do they make change of, make sense of this change? And I'm just going to focus on the last part here. Um, change as compatible with personal and communal values. We often like uh, think of the Rohingya community as, as one entity where everybody shares like the same ideas and that's pretty much true, but at the same time, like these women didn't see themselves as going against the rules. They saw themselves as compliant with the rules. And we discussed about Purda, this practice of, of Rohingya women in which they have to uh, hide themselves from the gaze of like men that are not relatives and that makes them stay at home most of the time. And they told me, well, actually I comply with Purda because when I go out, I don't talk to men and, unless it's like really needed, you know, for, for serving the community and I'm covering myself and my husband allows me, so I'm completely compliant with Purda. So we see that even though Purda is like a very well shared idea in the community, um, there are some like different reasons or some, some different ways that women find to comply with, with what is ex expected of them and at the same time still manage to participate. All in all, what, what this comes to say is sometimes when we talk about uh, women participation um, and we see that, uh, that we are a bit risk averse and rightly so sometimes because of course we don't want to disturb the community, we don't want to impose ourselves, but there are also individuals within the larger community that have their own ideas and, and maybe like most women do not want to participate, do not want to leave their house and that's completely respectable, but there are also fewer women that may be trying to um, get out, participate, engage, and we shouldn't disregard that just because the majority of the community thinks otherwise. Uh, it's, it's good to like know what the, the larger community thinks, but we also need to acknowledge that there are dissenters sometimes, or just people that, you know, that are willing to, to take a risk. And, and these women spoke of participation very happily, very um, you know, positively. They were showing absolutely no shame, no, no regret, uh, and I think that's important that, you know, that we need to look at these individuals because these are the, the agents of change that, that we want in the community and, and they need to be supportive. Um, I think that's it for my time. Uh, I cannot take questions because there is no time, but I'm leaving my email there and I will leave in the chat the, the, the link so anybody can contact me if you want to, to chat more about this. Thanks yeah, a lot, guys. Please, yeah, thank you so much, Celeste. And please do leave your um, details in the in the chat as well, um, if you don't mind.